Right. Uh, so, uh, a few comments about uh, 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 the last lecture. Um, first, uh, we introduced uh, two polarization operators, the transverse and the longitudinal, which are roughly uh, il uh, dialectic uh, permeability, permittivity, and magnetic. This transverse is magnetic thing, and uh, longitudinal part of polarization operator is, uh, uh, and I said that uh, pi L uh, at omega zero, the basic sum rule, uh, excuse me, omega zero is equal to M. Um, and that, this, that was simple consequence of uh, of the Galilean symmetry. Uh, we just said that under electric field, uh, the, if you have a, some gas, it, it will accelerate. And uh, uh, that's the origin of this. Um, and therefore, the current will be growing with time. Time derivative of the current is fixed, so I shall not repeat the logic. Um, then, um, uh, the uh, one striking thing is that uh, in mm. uh, we can eat, first of all, uh, th th there must be a singularity, some singularity at omega k equal to zero. Singularity, uh, which is Mm. seen from the formula that if you take a conservation law for, for, for the density correlator, which is the same as omega square p0,0, zero, zero, uh, then uh, you have the relation from the conservation of current that it is equal to k square pi L uh, and uh, you see from this that uh, 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 that um, pi l um, at zero and k is equal to zero. That's what follows from here. Uh, so you see, uh, in one, and now we take omega to zero we get n, if we take k to zero first, this is, uh, so we, we conclude that pi L omega limit when you take k to zero first uh, is um, equal to n, and in the k limit it is equal to zero, which means that there is a singularity and at uh, and it is a different type of singularity uh, for normal fluid and for su for superfluid. Um, mm, the, uh, the the singularity uh, is actually quite simple. Let me to uh, to to just show you what kind of thing it is, is uh, uh, when you have so contribution of sound, for example, you get something like some formula mm, for actually P0,0. Zero, zero. Uh, it's proportional to K divided by omega minus uh, CK minus omega. And you see that if uh, and that's the, uh, the, how the difference between k and omega limit appears. You see, if you set uh, k to zero first, you get zero. Uh, if you uh, do it uh, in a different way, uh, omega first, you get one over c. And that's uh, the, the, the mathematical mechanism which operates here. So you have this... Uh, <coughs> difference between omega and k limit. I forgot uh, to tell you last time that this is 
uh, general con the general consequence of, of conservation law. But the difference uh, with superfluid uh, is that all this is true, but uh, in superfluid you have uh, singularities uh, only in pi L, but not in pi T. Um, this is because you have a gap uh, in superconductors and you have only excitations with sound excitations in uh, both the gas. In Fermi gas you have a mass gap. And, um, and so uh, when you have uh, no singularity in transverse reaction, uh, that gives you, uh, gives you superfluidity. That's one common comment which I wanted to add to the uh, yesterday discussion. Um, Oh, by the way, uh, uh, a good uh, a question is, so, so we, we concluded that uh, in the Fermi liquid or non-interacting gas, uh, you have uh, particle hole excitations which contribute both to pi L and pi T. And so uh, in normal fluid, uh, pi t at uh, 0 and k, the reaction to the transverse field, to the magnetic field, is actually uh, proportional to k square. And that gives, as I explained, uh, di diamagnetism. In superfluid, it gives you a constant, and that gives you the Meissner effect. And I also repeat, uh, I mentioned that Meissner effect and Higgs mechanisms are the same thing. Um, it's all coming from the fact that photon becomes massive. In, in uh, pi t, non-zero non, non pi t, this is photon mass in the medium. Uh, one question. Uh, uh, you know that in uh, insulators uh, you also have a mass gap. Uh, or in semiconductors you also have a mass gap. Uh, so one might think that, uh, and we said that if you have a mass gap in your excitations, well then uh, Mm, this this formula mm, and this seem to be incompatible, so we have some problem with this. Mm, once again, the question I'm asking you is this. Uh, suppose uh, we apply these things. You have a crystal and electron gas, and in this case you know there are bands, energy bands, uh, and uh, excitations, particle hole excitations, which were gapless. Uh, in our case, now acquire a gap, and that seems to contradict to what I just said. So how to resolve, because I said that pi L, by all means, must have a singularity at omega k equals zero. Uh, and pi T, if it doesn't have singularity, it means superfluidity, and no one wants to say that insulators are superfluid, um, so or superconducting. Um, so the question is, where is the, how to resolve this? The 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 puzzle uh, comes through this relation, and. Uh, if we don't have this relation, there is no problem. But uh, this relation tells you that there's a there's a z zero there's a zero frequency, zero momentum singularity, zero mass singularity. And M here was the total to charge. To to total density of particles. Yeah, and we derived it. Uh, 
uh, by looking at the current produced uh, this is the definition of the polarization operator and now I took I take a constant uniform electric field Huh? What? Uh, yeah, well, the thing, but you, you still have electrons uh, there. Uh, it, it takes it takes a gap uh, to excite particle hole. Uh, that's true, but uh, you certainly have some density um, density of. Uh, you have just crystal and electrons flying uh, or not flying or bounded, uh, but they are there. So what's, uh, there is a very general and simple resolution to this. Uh, and the answer is uh, Galilean symmetry. Uh, here we allowed uh, the whole bunch of electrons to when we apply constant field, they start to move with the velocity, or better to say translation variance, they start to move with the velocity uh, as a whole. So we have the bunch of electrons and it moves and it satisfies the equation. This equation and this equation is equivalent to this one. But this equation is not true when you have a crystal there inside the crystal. So there's, if you apply a uh, constant electric field, they will be colliding uh, with, uh, with the atoms of ions of the crystal, and so there will be no, no motion as a whole. And, and indeed, if you look at, at it uh, more carefully, you will find that uh, in, in, instead of this, you will find that n equals zero for this thing. Uh, so that's the resolution. One more comment. Let's see we have superconductivity. Oh, no, no. Uh, no, it's zero. It's zero. And when it's a zero, you don't have superconductivity. It requires uh, the, the law. Superconductivity is equivalent to the London equation. No, I mean, superconductors, there are also crystals, right? Uh, yeah. Well, but, uh, of course, uh, but uh, you see, when you have metal and you, you look at the, this, indeed, this relates to an idealized problem uh, in which we simply have uh, interacting Bose particles or interacting Fermi particles. That applies only. The, when you have, uh, it's true that when you have to crystal, you have to modify this relation, but in fact, it's this modification for the uh, superconductors is minimal. It doesn't really change anything. Uh, the use of the crystals essentially just n should be put to zero. In not not uh, not n. N of course there is a uh, there is density. What should be polarization operator which you calculate? It's it's all. There is no mystery here. This is one loop polarization operator. This is electron and hole excitations. You take uh, what, what I described to you before relates to the gas in which these are either free particle or they, they, there is self-interaction between them. Um, and this self-interaction uh, doesn't violate translation symmetry. That's very important. Um, you can more formally derive it from word identities related to translation symmetry. Uh, now, now you introduce external potential. What crystal does, it, it adds periodic potential to the problem. And now these are green functions in the periodic potential, which have di very different property. When you calculate pi L, and pi t, you will get zero from this diagram at, at zero momentum and zero frequency. So that's uh, how it will be. But uh, when you have, uh, uh, well, mm, uh, the 
periodic potential is uh, does this very, when you start. I, I shall not go into this. It will be a long discussion. But super, for superfluids, it's quite irrelevant. This periodic potential, although it is there, of course. Um, uh, so that's, that's, as I said, it's a good exercise to take the green functions of free particles and check it explicitly by by calculation. I suggest you do this. Uh, and then, in the same way, you can take uh, uh, you can take an insulator, a band insulator, uh, in which uh, you have mass gaps in this diagram. It has no singularity, this diagram in this case. And you will indeed get a zero. And the, it will not as I said, it's, it, it, there's no contradiction because translation invariance is lost. Important thing here is the potential, no translation symmetry. <clears throat> and um, by the way, a physical example without which, as I said, for superconductors there is periodic potential, but it's not important. But in superfluids there is simply no periodic potential, there is strict translation invariant. Uh, you can consider, for example, it both, uh, as a Bose example, it's helium-4. As Fermi example, it's helium-3. It has its own problem, its own complications, but we will not go into this. Um, it's more. Uh, <coughs> uh, I, I was just, uh, my intention was to show you the power of general principles. You just can derive the fundamental equations from very general reasoning without uh, going into details. And that's maybe the most important equation of superconductivity. Of, of, it's one of the most important equations in physics, I would say, this, mice, uh, this London equation. Um, and as I said, this is the photon mass. Mm. Precisely. It's literally the same as Higgs mechanism. Uh, one more comment, which uh, I should have uh, said last time, a uh, thing which I should have said last time, is uh, about um, uh, the same diagram in magnetic field. As I said, uh, there is this uh, quantum hole conductivity. Uh, the interesting, th there is an interesting uh, thing to follow from here, uh, which is the, which is this: um, in the ordinary matter without magnetic field, uh, we have uh, effective energy, effective free energy, which contains uh, electric term, which is bilinear in field strength. It contains electric term magnetic term. Uh, but when you have this thing, uh, you have an extra term which is called the Chern-Simons term. You see, it's the polarization operator in the standard case is quadratic in momentum. Here it's linear. And that gi that's given by the so-called Chern-Simons action which it, which actually first appeared in mathematics, a alpha d beta a gamma. Uh, and which is responsible for whole conductivity. Now, it's uh, the reason I invoked it uh, is that it also it has a quite interesting feature with which we will be which we will be discussing in, in some other situations as well. Namely, uh, let's check it. You see, this is the field strength. So it's obviously gauge invariant. But let's discuss gauge invariance of this guy. Although it seems that there's nothing to discuss because it's gauge invariant by construction. But there is something to discuss, in fact. <coughs> 
uh, as I, by the, uh, yeah, well, that is something to discuss. So let's look at Chern Simon's action. I don't have much time for this, but uh, but we will just we'll mention this gamma, and let's change a alpha to a alpha plus d alpha phi. Uh, then you will get uh, the following: mm. the variation of s will be equal to. Uh, uh, epsilon alpha beta gamma. Uh, the only term will, which will come from here it will be d alpha phi d beta a gamma. This is explicitly invariant. I shall rewrite it as uh, d alpha of, uh, we can write it down as d alpha of epsilon alpha beta gamma d beta a gamma. And uh, and the integral here, the integral here. The reason for my why I'm doing this is this boundary term which arises. And excuse me, there is also phi here. So it is it will be phi f alpha beta d sigma alpha beta two-dimensional <laughs> integral. And you see the interest and this integrated over the boundary of your, of your manifold. Uh, that's the key feature. There is a subtle thing which we will see again and again in ADS CFT and so on, that there, there are two types of gauge symmetries. In one gauge, in the standard Maxwell action, Maxwell action is just f alpha beta square. In this case, uh, when you have a bounded teaching, gauge function uh, can be arbitrary. The function phi, there are no constraints on it. And as, you, as a result of this, um, of, uh, of, of this lack of constraint, we reduce, we have Four vector potentials, but the real number uh, number of states uh, in the Maxwell case uh, is two, as you know. Uh, gauge invariance reduces the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, here it's more subtle. If you count the number of degrees of freedom coming from this action, uh, you will get zero. But to get to get precise zero, you you will need gauge transformation, which are non-vanishing at the boundary. So there are two types of gauge gauge transformations. Some vanish at the boundary. Some don't vanish at the boundary. And you see that the Chern Simon section is peculiar because it has it is not gauge invariant with respect to unrestricted gauge transformation. It's uh, invariant only with respect to gauge transformation vanishing at the boundary. As a result of it, in the bulk you cancel all degrees of freedom, but on the boundary you don't cancel. You don't have uh, symmetry to, to eliminate these degrees, boundary degrees of freedom. And indeed, quantum whole current it's carried along the boundary. It's, it, it is carried by some excitations, of, by some boundary excitations. It's all the consequence of this, uh, of, of, this uh, of, of the necessity to restrict the gauge function. So that's uh, an interesting point to be remembered, and, but we, will, we now will move. Um, uh, Further, um, but just uh, I think it's good idea to keep in mind uh, that the same will happen actually in mm, 
in the case of uh, uh, gravity and so on, uh, that uh, one should be very careful about talking about gauge symmetry, which gauge symmetry one has in mind, whether one restricts oneself uh, to the gauge function vanishing or non-vanishing. Anyway, um, Uh, by the way, this formula, uh, I'm jumping back, uh, is true for uh, both gas, but it, will, it looks differently, and that's why I'm asking you to do the calculation. It looks differently when you have free Fermi gas. You have an integral, but still you will see that uh, there is this remarkable feature. <coughs> yes? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's uh, trivial in the bulk. Um, you can see it in many ways. Uh, it will uh, first. We have to understand uh, why uh, we have only two degrees of freedom in the, st in the Maxwell case. And we actually, the, I remind you very briefly the argument. The argument is uh, you take, you can always, by making gauge transformation, uh, eliminate A0. Uh, but then uh, you still have uh, gauge transformation. dn phi, which are time independent. And uh, using this gauge transformation, you can actually restrict, uh, you can reach the gauge dn a n equal to zero. Uh, I shall do it better, actually. It's, I don't have time for this, but it's an important uh, question, actually. So I probably will explain it uh, better. My point, first of all, uh, my point is that by by the gauge transformations, you can uh, actually reach the gauge where you have no a zero and where you have uh, transverse photons. This describes in momentum space as just describes polarization the photon flies this way. Uh, and so generally the photon, I shall return and explain better, but I, I want to finish the logic. So the, there's d minus two degrees of freedom for the photon. In d equals three, we are dealing with two plus one dimension in quantum hole. Uh, we have uh, one degree of freedom only, yes, from this formula. But this formula refers to this thing. And this is the second order differential equation. From Chen Simons, you get the first order differential equation. So I'm not proving this yet, uh, but I'm making it plausible that there will be less degrees of freedom than one. And less than one means zero. Uh, so uh, that's why Chan Simons has zero degrees of freedom. But now let me do it in a more in a systematic. This, you see, I, 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 I am spending time to this because counting the, of degrees of freedom is important topic in general, and I want you want to give you the logic. Uh, of, of this counting. Uh, first of all, what are the degrees of freedom? How to define what we mean by degrees of freedom? A natural definition is this. Let's suppose we have a scalar field and you have Klein-Gordon equation. You ask the, the following thing. How many functions you have to fix to fix the solution? Suppose you, at time zero you want to you want to solve the Cauchy problem, so you have some data at time zero. Uh, and what are these data? 
to to specify the solution completely. Yeah, you have two functions, phi of x0 and phi dot of x0. And then if you have this function fixed, then you calculate from the equation you will find phi double dot, phi triple dot, and so on. So when you need to fix this pair of function, it's natural to call it uh, one degree of freedom because it corresponds to scalar particles. Okay, uh, now uh, we want to ask the question how many, uh, suppose we have a Dirac equation. Um, it has, uh, how many functions uh, does it have? How many degrees of freedom it has? I'm asking you this uh, question. Uh, we have the Dirac equation and let's define the, we already defined the degrees of, the number of degrees of freedom by uh, uh, by just saying how many functions we have to fix uh, in order to uh, what? No. Uh, you have um, uh, the key point is that you have the first order equation here. Okay. Uh, so what you have to fix? Uh, what? One half. For why one half? Because the square root of one uh, uh, Well, um, I, uh, I'm trying to. Mm, uh, I apologize for using Russian because I cannot translate it. But <laughs> there is a child a rhyme uh, in Russian. И получилось в ответе два землекопа и две трети. The answer, uh, it's a child uh, kind of verse, but anyway, forget it. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I was uh, uh, saying here is that uh, you have the spinner solution of this equation. Now I'm starting to get, slowly starting to get serious. Um, Psi alpha, alpha goes from 1 to 4, and you have psi alpha of x and 0, it must be fixed. You don't have to fix time derivative because it's a first order equation. The first time derivative will, will be generated by this equation. Um, so, you see, you, you need four functions. While for the scalar field, you need two functions. No, but I mean this is one, like I mean this one spin. What? Like this is like column of, of, of psi, right? Well, whatever it is, it's just a collection of four, yeah, four yeah. quantities. But I think, you know, what, what, what I meant is that, yeah, what, what, I call it one half because it's basically psi equals. We, we, we fix uh, one spin array. It's basically consists of four quantities, but I thought it's just one. Right? But we define degrees of freedom, uh, number of degrees of freedom. It, they they don't know this term, spinner or not spinner. It's just a collection of quant collection of functions, and you have the equation gamma mu, alpha beta, t mu psi beta, sum over beta, and so on. You have just an odd uh, partial differential equation for four functions four components, four functions. And the, what I want to stress uh, now is that you, you cannot and should not fix time derivatives here. Unlike here, you need the function itself at the moment zero and time derivative. Because only then you can calculate phi double dot, okay? Uh, here, the, you can easily calculate time derivative of psi in terms of, of the data. 
so it's not it's not an arbitrary number. It's just something to be calculated. So you have four functions to be fixed here and two functions here, which means that here we have two degrees of freedom, uh, as it should be because it's spin one half. You see, uh, that's in complicated cases. It's very good uh, idea to to count things like that. Uh, just uh, and now uh, we we'll look at the. Was real or complex? Real, yeah. It's, if we take real phi, if it is complex, of course it will be it is double. It's double. But that's the, the, the same thing refers to the scalar field. Mm -hmm. uh, since I started with real scalar field, I don't want to introduce electric charge. Uh, I, I, I should compare it with the real spinner field. Uh, now, uh, uh, now we have to look in the same way uh, at the Maxwell equation. Um, here uh, we have, we um, uh, can, uh, the, well, there are many ways of counting this. Uh, let's go to the momentum space and we, by uh, fixing, we can always use this gauge fixing to, to reach the gauge, the so-called Lorentz gauge, Q alpha A alpha equal to zero, but, and then Q square A alpha should be equal to zero, uh, but this, the gauge is under fixed, it's not completely fixed yet because we still can perform this transformation uh, because uh, using Q square equal to zero. So we still have, if you um, reach uh, the Lorentz gauge, which is this one, you still have a gauge freedom in your equations to eliminate uh, one more components. And you can use this freedom to eliminate the component I0. Therefore, uh, you, you will have uh, the, the resulting equations to which you reduce the Maxwell equations are this. Uh, I am now writing it again for, uh, to be more uh, clear in... Uh, Uh, in coordinate space. N is 1, 2, 3, and dNAN is 0. So you can, by gauge transformations, you can, you can reduce it to this level. And now we start playing games again. We have uh, three arbitrary... Uh, 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 here you have three degrees of freedom without this condition, and one degree of freedom is eliminated by this condition. So you have two degrees of freedom. Uh, transverse fields. Uh, gauge transformation was used twice. Once uh, to eliminate, uh, once to reach the Lorentz gauge, uh, and the second time uh, it was not yet fixed. So the second time it was used to go to this uh, transverse gauge, to a Coulomb gauge. Um, and after that, the number of functions, it's two degrees of freedom, which means that you need to fix four functions, uh, an and an dot, satisfying this condition. So that's, and, uh, and you see, the lesson we see is that uh, degrees of freedom is de defined, the number of degrees of freedom is defined by the number of components and the order of differential equations together, like we see in Dirac case. Uh, and in, in the Chern Simons case, uh, the, it's very simple in the bulk. Uh, you simply have Fij equal to zero, that this is your equation. Uh, and this, then you simply eliminate all, mm. all particles. 
You see, if you take uh, FIJ equal to zero, by gauge transformation, you can set AI to zero. Uh, oh, that's because I vary this thing, delta S, delta A alpha, and it will be epsilon alpha beta gamma, d beta A gamma. This is strong. So it, uh, it will give you zero. I will give you another, uh, that's uh, actually, there is another uh, view on this, why it should be so, why it cannot describe any degree, bulk degrees of freedom. Uh, and that is, um, look at this action. Uh, suppose you want to write it in gravitational field. Uh, for those of you who know this notations with differential forms, it's A wedge product to dA. And uh, if you couple it to uh, th this expression written in this form, is invariant under arbitrary coordinate transformation. You can change x to f of x, and it's quite remarkable, because usually we, in general relativity, we also have invariance under diffeomorphisms, but we reach this, we achieve this invariance um, uh, by introducing the metric tensor. So we have the metric tensor coupled to meta, uh, and if the coupling is arranged so that everything is uh, diffeomorphic invariance. And that gives you the coupling of gravity to matter. Now, what can you conclude about coupling of gravity to this guy? How gravity couples to the Chan Simons field? It does not. So, imagine for one moment that there is a real degree of freedom. Then we have a bad puzzle, a bad paradox, because you have a particle which doesn't gravitate. Um, such things should not exist. Uh, there's, the answer is, uh, uh, it, the answer is, it, it does not. <laughs> okay, it ca I'm carried pretty far away from what I wanted to talk about, but I think it's an important and interesting uh, subject. Um, <clears throat> Should, yeah. to, to G gravity, where there are no dynamical like, degrees of freedom, but there are topological? Uh, well, there are topological degrees of freedom here in the sense that there are boundary excitations, that you cannot eliminate everything at the boundary. And at the bound, uh, it, but in the uh, so it it does couple to boundary gra to boundary gravity, uh, and that's for sure. But uh, in the bulk, we see that uh, degrees of freedom are absent, and that's related since it describes the quantum hole. Um, which which feature of quantum hole fluid it corresponds to? the fact that we have no degrees of freedom in the bulk. There is some... Or... Uh, yeah, it's a, exactly. It's uh, when you... This is like Landau free energy. It's low energy, approximate, effective action. But microscopically, you have uh, Landau level, electron gas, Landau levels, uh, and um, there is a gap between the two levels. Uh, therefore, there is no uh, degrees of free, no masses degrees of freedom. For if you apply some very slowly varying field, it will not excite anything. Uh, it will remain uh, <coughs> remain in the same state. Mm. Uh, Actually, the key point for the quantum hall is that there's always, uh, even for fractional feeling with disorder, you have, uh, um, you have a gap in the spectrum. But 
if you force me now to uh, to uh, go to the quantum hall case, we will never finish this. Um, all right. Um, so uh, what we what we started doing last time was the uh, analysis of the following very simple action. Uh, we have some action which is proportional to d alpha phi square d two x. I start with two with a two dimensional uh, with a two dimensional case uh, uh, and. We have to calculate the, the functional integral e to the minus s of phi. Um, uh, and and the key point uh, we sh now uh, we generally want to. Uh, if we usually start with analyzing the saddle point of the action. And if we have several saddle points, uh, we write down their contribution plus quantum correction. So the first question to ask is uh, what are the saddle points? And the saddle points should satisfy this equation, which formally, when we look at it, is just the Laplace equation for phi. And it would have no, uh, no solution at all, probably if we assume that at infinity things go to zero, then there is no non-singular solution, of course, of the Laplace equation. Um, by the way, how would you prove this? Uh, quickly, it, that uh, the Laplace has no, cannot have any, any non-trivial solutions from the variational principle. Uh, the proof is this: uh, you have the d alpha f phi square, uh, which. Uh, by integrating by part as phi d square phi plus the boundary term, which is zero. So we see that if uh, d square phi, if this is zero, then this must be zero also, because it's positive otherwise. Uh, again, simple trick, of simple idea of proof, which you good to have in, keep in mind in other problems. Uh, anyway, the uh, we discussed last time that there are some special solutions uh, of this thing. Uh, and those special solutions are multi-valued phi's. So phi is sum of Q A uh, alpha A, where alpha is, you have a point A, and alpha is in a given, is just the angle uh, from which we see the, uh, from this given point as seen by this, this vortex. Or we can write it down as imaginary part of the logarithm of z minus z a. Uh, the theorem which I mentioned about the absence of solutions is not working because it's multivalued, but this multivaluedness is uh, actually allowed. Again, I will explain where it comes from. And can we obtain these classical solutions from something normal from there? After all, if you have a, suppose we have a lattice, suppose we have uh, at each side of the lattice we have phi x, which changes from 0 to 2 pi. And suppose we have the, we compare this with the 
product in which we don't have all these strange multivalued functions. Uh, we just have ordinary functions and uh, some periodic phi x minus phi x plus delta. Uh, and we assume that this energy is periodic. Um, periodic and uh, when the argument is small, it uh, reduces to u of x uh, as x goes to 0 is simply x squared. But it's periodic function, like for instance cosine. You can visualize it as cosine phi x sum over x and delta, cosine phi x minus phi x plus delta. Now, what I'm saying is that, and for uh, uh, if, uh, for example, if the coefficient in front of the sign, let me write it down more cleanly. Uh, so we have minus beta sum x and delta cosine phi x minus phi x plus delta. Um, uh, we actually, uh, if we expand cosine, we get uh, in the continuum limit, we get uh, this d phi square action. Um, now, what all these extra solutions which we found here mean? Uh, there are normal solutions of if you minimize this action. Uh, you will obtain some, you will obtain the equation something like sine phi x minus phi x plus delta, sum over delta uh, must be zero. Uh, that's just the variation of this thing. Um, and which formally would reduce to the Laplace equation it form in the continuous limit. Uh, it, it will reduce to the Laplace equation uh, when you add delta and minus delta together. Uh, but there will be extra solutions. So what I'm just saying is that vortices, this, the classical solution of, it, of this type, can be understood as perfectly normal solutions of disc in the discrete problem. It is just that we, uh, uh, that I discussed last time, you, you have to account for multivaluedness of phi, but it uh, appears as from the totally normal minimization on a lattice. But in the continuum limit, you have these strange, strange solutions, which are called vortices. And these vortices, um, uh, play a very important role. Mm. Namely, um, we will see now that if, uh, if we add the external field, if we want to calculate the polarization operator, uh, these vortices, when they condense, um, they can compensate the potential A alpha. And uh, I shall make it clear in a moment what I'm saying. So this part of discussion was just to uh, assert that uh, we are not changing the rule of the game. We, we just uh, have periodic uh, a problem with, with angular variable, and we use normal rules for, for finding its extremum, and, but uh, then in continuum it looks like that. Um, now, let's calculate the contribution of those vortices. Um, you can easily see 
uh, that th this thing will be proportional to sum over a and b, uh, q a, q b, uh, logarithm z a minus z b. So the vortices, uh, and if we had um, Yes. Uh, how we obtain this this formula? Uh, by simply uh, differentiating this logarithm. And uh, when you differentiate this logarithm, we, we want to, the convenient way to do this is just to write down as dz bar, dz, dz bar of phi. You will get uh, the expression precisely equal to this. So uh, it's actually quite interesting because uh, you get uh, totally new objects which are more or less from nowhere. And these objects are interacting logarithmically. Which means that we have to calculate the following thing. We have to calculate the partition function which is the in integral d2 z a. Uh, it also has sum over possible vorticities uh, of e to the minus beta sum q a q b logarithm of z a minus c b. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, there is a critical point here. Uh, in one, there are two phases described by this uh, by this partition function. As to be expected, actually, because we want to describe phase transition to term to uh, superfluidity, so we do expect some phase transition. But where it comes from? If beta is large enough, I shall make the evaluation momentarily, then uh, the vortices form dipoles. Uh, it is clearly a um, good idea for the when you have, suppose you have plus and minus vortex. Um, the energy between them will be uh, q square. Let's q, q square. The charge is q. It's minus q. Q square multiplied by the logarithm uh, of the distance. Uh, and uh, it is actually uh, for better large. It's a, a what is the stand to keep close to each other? Uh, but there is another factor. So energetically, it's always uh, you minimize energy by uh, forming these dipoles, or they are called also vortex molecules. But uh, when you increase temperature, at some point uh, they actually. Uh, the entropy become more important. Uh, and you can see this by, by, by looking at the contribution to the partition function, which looks like, like this. It's integral d to r, which is the position r is this thing. And uh, uh, you have e to the minus q square, beta q square, logarithm of r. And you see that uh, it gives you d to r divided by r beta q square. And if beta is large enough, it, the integral is dominated by, by the cutoff distances at which uh, you have, uh, at, at which vortices stick together. But at some critical temperature, you expect uh, the decay of vortices. Uh, 
this can be this qualitative arguments can be supported by a quite rigorous calculation and uh, the, this phase transition to the, from uh, vortices which are practically non-existent and irrelevant you have just plus and minus things uh, to when the entropy prevails uh, they become randomly distributed uh, distributed through the system uh, it, uh, we will see in a moment that uh, actually uh, in gauge theory uh, this will be phenomenon confinement to uh, versus deconfinement actually confinement of these vortices means uh, deconfinement of charges and vice versa. We will, well, I, I'm probably getting ahead of myself here. Uh, so, once again, uh, there is nothing uh, very surprising that we are doing. A little bit surprising, I think, is that uh, search for the lattice minima. On the lattice, uh, there are many of those lattice models with cosine or any periodic interaction, they have uh, many special minima of the action, not, not a non-trivial one, uh, which we interpret like vortices. And indeed, if you look at the lattice, uh, what position of spins, if, if phi uh, is the direction of, of the spin, then uh, if you follow one vertex after another, you have this vorticity sitting at the sitting at the center of the at the dual lattice. So that's one thing mm, that on a lattice there are many many minima. A slightly surprising thing that you don't have to go to the lattice to recover them. Uh, in the long range approximation, in the long wave approximation, they all are given by this simple formula. On a lattice they depend of course on concrete lattice, on the concrete lattice whether it's a, a square lattice or whether it's hexagonal lattice, uh, but solutions will be different of course. But in the continuum, they all be this of this type. Um, uh, in gauge theory, we will, to which we are coming, it will be just magnetic monopoles in the two-dimensional uh, uh, superfluid theory. It's vortices, and when vortices are irrelevant, and there are two phases. In one phase. Uh, the distance between the size of the dipole is of the lattice or the integral diverges at r equal to zero and the size which means that it is cut off by the lattice uh, uh, effects. Mm. But it, so it's basically to say that in this phase vortices don't play any role and we have the action if they don't have play any role. Uh, the action which we described last time is this one. Rho, it's the density of particles. Uh, and um, the free energy will be rho divided by 2 A alpha perpendicular square. And that means that the action moves as a whole because the free energy by when we apply uh, vector potential, the free energy uh, just you just add this term, which is mv squared divided by two, uh, and nothing more than that. Mm. Uh, you can also say uh, that. Uh, adding constant potential is the same as uh, changing phi, phi minus vx, uh, 
uh, and because of this change, uh, the free energy changes, which means something, uh, which means that the system uh, has a long range order because uh, you you can actually compare you, you are just saying that we can impose this impose these boundary conditions as x goes to infinity when we impose these boundary conditions then uh, you get um, you either you change things at the boundaries. You see, remember I, I told you that to test superfluid, you, you start moving the boundaries of the system and see whether it follows or not. And that's, you see here very clearly, phi goes to Vx is your boundary condition. And if the free energy depends on V, that means that it is sensitive to the boundary condition. You are in superfluid phase. If it is not sensitive, as we will see happens with vortices, then, uh, th then there's, uh, it's a normal fluid. <clears throat> the normal fluid remains at rest. Uh, 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 when you move the walls, it moves with the walls. The superfluid remains at rest. And that's, that you see in this very simple action. But all this is correct, so if you neglect vorticity, vortices, then uh, you simply have, always would have a, a superfluid phase. Okay, now when uh, vorticity becomes, uh, vortices become uh, uh, deconfined, so one phase is confined vortices, and this is superfluid. When vortices de uh, deconfine, uh, you um, get a normal fluid. The transition is, uh, is related to this production of vorticity, quantized vorticity, let's say. By the way, of course, I, I, I have stressed this, that QA are integers because we need the phase, which is the, um, uh, which is this uh, uh, two pi periodic. Uh, all right, uh, the w one last comment about it, and we, we move to the gauge case, to the gauge case, which will be very similar to this one, uh, is that in order to calculate anything, to calculate the effect of, uh, of, of the correlations, you have to look at the correlation functions of this type, phi of r minus phi of zero. And uh, if vortices are uh, irrelevant, it goes like one or r uh, to the, to, it's a Gaussian integral, very easy to calculate, and it's r to the c n square. It goes down like a power. Uh, if you include vortices, what will happen? The vortices will break the correlation. If you have many vortices in between, the correlation will be exponential. So this is a superfluid. And it, it will be uh, e to the minus lambda r in the normal phase when vortices dominate. Um, uh, so that's uh, how to calculate it. You have to do some work for which we don't have time, uh, namely to take these vortices find their contribution to these correlation functions and integrate over all possible z. So roughly speaking, qualitatively speaking, what happens is that uh, random vortices disorder the system in such a way 
that the, correla that the correlation breaks down. Something similar happens uh, in um, semiconductors uh, when you add uh, a lot of uh, impurities. Uh, you will you 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 will eventually get like what is called localization, uh, namely that uh, the current will not be able to uh, propagate or metal whatever. Uh, 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 so here, uh, those spontaneously created by by fluctuation vortices spontaneously created the defects. Uh, they uh, actually. Mm, uh, prevent the correlation. Uh, now, one more thing about this. Uh, let's consider now some analogous problems. Here we, uh, by the way, oh, excuse me, the, one more thing about this particular problem. You see that you, when you calc when you include multi-valued phi, they, in a sense, can cancel A alpha. So once again, if phi is a univalued function, then you get this result, because A alpha perpendicular uh, is, uh, does not um, actually cannot be compensated by this purely longitudinal thing. But uh, in a sense, Vortices create a gauge field. Ga they uh, actually make the theory gauge theory. They manage d alpha phi for multi-valued phi is able to cancel this a alpha. So in the superflu in the normal phase, f uh, is equal to zero. This could be instead of a alpha square. And as you increase temperature, actually rho is replaced by what is called superfluid density, and this superfluid density tends to zero. Um, so that's uh, how things are here. It's an interesting idea, never been developed completely, uh, that uh, you can view gauge fields as manifestation of ordinary fields, but multi-valued. Um, it's still worth thinking about it. Uh, the straightforward fact is that uh, in this uh, vortex phase, uh, this d alpha phi can erase this a alpha square. Now, there is something similar uh, which happens, uh, in fact, what those multi-valued fields were first introduced in the elasticity theory. Me, could, yes. Could you say that like vortices, they are like some additional degree of freedom? Yes, 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 they are additional degree of freedom and they somehow, to some extent, uh, they imitate gauge fields. Mm. But as I said, it's never been completely clear uh, in what's, well, some part of it is completely clear, but may, I have a feeling that there is something more than that uh, behind. Um, elasticity. In elasticity, you uh, define, you describe the system by deformation. You have a crystal or, or continuous body, and uh, under stress, uh, you actually uh, displace uh, the points in this body. And you introduce uh, the vector, the deformation vector. And um, the free energy, uh, so A alpha eventually will be analogous to this phi. And free energy has the structure d alpha u beta plus d beta. It should depend on gradients, of course. 
um, uh, because uh, when you move the body as a whole, the energy doesn't change. And this is the land of free energy for, the, for this thing. All is quite simple. Uh, these uh, constants, there, some, some there of their combinations are called the Young moduli in elasticity theory. Um, now, so far it's pretty straightforward. You can calculate correlations and so on. It's a Gaussian, Gaussian, Gaussian free energy. Uh, however, there is an interesting thing. Uh, this theory would not describe just as without vortices, we would never describe uh, the phase transition from normal to superfluid. Uh, here also uh, there will be a problem. And one has to, in to add here the following thing. Let's consider a crystal. with a defect, namely, uh, let's suppose that one of the crystal planes ends somewhere. Um, and this is interpreted as, uh, if you now go uh, and look for deformations here, 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 and here, you will find that uh, d alpha u beta integrated over the closed contour. Let's suppose we are far from this defect. Defect is the end of the crystal plane, and it is called dislocation. Uh, the integral over large contour, it, it will be just uh, equal to the distance between the atoms and the crystal. Uh, so it will be d alpha and it will be equal to a beta. Um, because uh, removing one plane would uh, result in, uh, it's, it's just a direct analog of uh, So we are describing once again the same story as before. We are describing the lattice in the continuum limit. But to have correct continuum limit, you have to add those dislocations here and vortices uh, in the superfluid. Um, so, uh, and as a result, uh, there is a dislocations uh, when you increase temperature, you create more and more dislocations, those defects in the, in the crystal. And at some point, like vortices deconfine, dislocation also can deconfine. And what do you think is happening? We have a phase transition. What physical phenomenon is this? It's just melting. You just described melting by, by the, precisely in the same way as you do here. And now one another question. Uh, here we have a uh, gauge field, vector gauge field. Mm. What do you think, of, and in a, we said in a sense, vortices imitate uh, this gauge field and able to cancel it here? What will be the analog of A alpha here? Yeah, it's gravitational field. Uh, actually, you can study the reaction of the, of the crystal towards gravitational field. And for that, you simply have to study the free energy of this type. And without, uh, and the same story, without dislocations, F will be proportional to H alpha beta perpendicular square. Uh, but after, the, after melting, dependence on H will simply be eliminated. And that's, again, 
the, the, this, this thing is the analog of, Meissen, of the Meissner effect and of the uh, Higgs mechanism mm, in particle physics. All the, all the same, the same thing. And uh, interaction between, there are, of, of, this is only one type of defect which is encountered in crystal. There are also some a specific rotation of the crystal plane, which is called disclination, uh, which uh, uh, also have to be accounted. But that's, uh, that, that's this is subtleties. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, people in elasticity theory often use uh, general relativity to describe, uh, to, for solving problems, because uh, Indeed, those uh, deformations with, with dislocations, they imitate gravitational field. Um, but, but our primary interest is not, not in elasticity, but in gauge theories. What I'm thinking, by the way, it's uh, getting spiritual aid. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, sorry for keeping you. Well, let's stop here. We will continue next time. Um, I, I, I just was carried away. It's a, such an interesting subject uh, that I forgot about time. Um, what fascinates me is that so such a completely different parts of physics uh, are described by the same ideas. It, it seems that the stock of good ideas is limited and nature uses them everywhere. <laughs>